himself nothing by taking the very nature of his, of his servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, as a as a as oh, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God itself him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That at that name is Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth, under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. The word of God. Let's pray over the word of God. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. It is a light unto our path. It is a mirror that shows us who we are. It's a revelation, O oh God, that shows us who you are. And so we pray that this would not be simply time of just another church service. But Lord Jesus, we come humbly seeking an encounter with you. We ask that you would cause these words to burst forth from their ink cage and live and dance in us in incarnate ways. And we ask the Holy Spirit that you would give us the strength to not simply be hearers of the word only, but doers also. It's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray and all God's people said. Amen. 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 This is not a Merry Christmas. This is not a Merry Christmas. Uh, for the children in this world that are not concerned with gifts, but how they'll survive another day without food. This is not a Merry Christmas uh, for those that are sick and afflicted with disease and illness and the loved ones that stand by those afflicted ones. This is not a Merry Christmas for those that are working uh, three jobs, uh, to try to put presents under a tree and going into debt to do that. And this is not a Merry Christmas. For the victims of the terrorist attacks recently in California and throughout the world. And this is not a Merry Christmas. In the nation that trumpets headlines like, God isn't fixing this. Mocking the people of prayer who offer consolation to the loved ones who have been recently killed. This is not a Merry Christmas in a nation that has forgotten what Christmas is even about. When Christmas has become about the Black Friday mosh pits and the Cyber Monday deals and eggnog and Christmas trees. Instead of the fact that God has put on flesh, made His dwelling among us, and irreparably changed creation. That's what Advent is about. That's what Christmas is about. That the love came down. This is not a Merry Christmas for those that live in a war-torn, poverty-stricken, disease-inflicted world. I wonder if Paul the Apostle ever had a not-so-Merry Christmas. I mean, surely after his abrupt uh, ending to his career as a terrorist where he was essentially killing Christians one day and then proclaiming the gospel the next. Paul's a guy who really went through the ringer, right? I mean, Paul was shipwrecked, snake bitten, lost at sea. Paul was in danger in the country, in danger in the city, in danger against Christians like himself, in danger against Jewish people, in danger against Gentiles. Paul was stoned and left for dead. He was beaten with rods. Paul was uh, beaten with the 39 stripes on numerous occasions, and ultimately, finally, he finds himself incarcerated for a capital offense for proclaiming the lordship of Jesus Christ in the Roman Empire uh, that proclaimed that the Caesar was here. But yet, it's from a prison cell that Paul authors this letter that we call Philippians. That throughout the ages, we have called this letter the letter of joy. It's a letter full of exuberance and excitement from a man who's literally uh, uh, looking at 
execution in a prison cell. It's a letter that Paul writes to a community that he dearly loves, the Philippians, a church that he himself planted. And we can read about that in the book of Acts in the 16th chapter. And it's in this letter that we get one of the most powerful statements, uh, a song, a poem, a very rhythmic kind of liturgical statement about who Jesus is, about his death, his resurrection and ascension. One of the most powerful statements about Jesus Christ in all the Bible. And it's perhaps Paul himself has authored this statement, or he's borrowing uh, from that confession of those first Christians who sang or professed this together, and he brings this into the letter to the second chapter of Philippians. From a prison cell, Paul asks the people at Philippi these questions. If there's any encouragement in Christ, See, Paul has suffered greatly. He has uh, went through a lot of affliction, but he knows that the people at Philippi have also gone through some struggles and some persecution. And so he says, if you have any encouragement by being in Christ, in the midst of a war-torn world, do you have encouragement by belonging to Jesus? And if you have any consolation from love, Oh, what is this love from above that Paul is talking about? The word there is agape love. We've probably heard that before, that selfless giving love that Jesus and Christ himself uh, embodied in his life and in his ministry. He says, if you have that love, then even in the midst of the affliction and the persecution, you have consolation, that you are comforted by that love. Do you have that love? Do you have that sharing in the spirit? The word there is koinonia numa. That, that word koinonia is a word that describes intimacy, intercourse, fellowship. It can also mean the common inheritance of a people, which in this case, the very inheritance, the very intimacy and fellowship that they share is the common inheritance of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, which has given birth to the community and sustains and gives the community. Paul says, if you have that koinonia, that fellowship, that love that's at the center of this community and the people of faith that follow Jesus Christ, then if you have compassion and sympathy, it's that love that awakens our hearts to the needs of others and we look at others through the eyes of faith with compassion and sympathy in their neediness and their brokenness. Paul says, if you have these things, then make my joy complete. Isn't it ironic that a man in a prison cell who's been beaten, shipwrecked, stoned, left for dead is in a state of joy? Paul's got this joy. Oh, I wish I could have that joy. Can somebody give me amen? It's a joy that's not predicated upon his freedom or his current circumstances. It's a joy that's not predicated upon the clothes that he wears or the food that he has to eat. It's a joy that's not predicated upon the distance of the people that he loves and cares about. It's a joy that he has that he tells us in the letter to the Galatians is a fruit of the Spirit. That's a product of a right relationship with the living God that defies all our current circumstances and all the situations of our lives because we have that joy because we have the Holy Spirit in our lives. And he said, you can make my joy complete. You can bring this state of joy to fruition. You, the people of God, by doing this, have the same mind. Be same-minded. People of one vision, one purpose, one mission. Be of one accord and having the same love. That same agape love that came down from above and touched this earth in the person of Jesus Christ. Being in full accord and of one mind. The people of God are supposed to be of one mind. What is that mind? Paul says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. Yeah. Now this is a hard word to hear in our culture, isn't it? It is so countercultural that from our very earliest formative years, we were taught to follow that, that impulse, right? To achieve and, and to compete and to scrap and to fight and to get and to own. 
But Paul says don't do anything uh, in that selfish ambition. See, in the United States of America, in the West in general, we believe in that rugged individualism that we can pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps and we can attain and that we can have if we work long enough and hard enough and fight uh, uh, hard enough. We can have those things that the world tells us we need to have. But Paul says don't do that. Don't, don't chase those things and don't live in selfish ambition and conceit, but in humility. One of the trademarks of the people of God is humility. Being right-sized in, in God. Not thinking more highly of ourselves than we ought to think, but knowing that we are human beings created in the image of God, which is a powerful thing. Amen. But regard others as better than yourselves. Again, this is so countercultural. In our culture, we call this the me generation, is the current generation, or the I generation. It's all about me, it's all about I, it's what I want, when I want it, all the time. And we actually are indoctrinating our children to live in that sense of entitlement. That it's about me and it's what I want all the time. But Paul says, no, regard others as better than yourselves. What they need is more important than what you need. And let each of you look not on the interest of yourselves, but on the interest of others. You know, in our culture, we truly are consumed with our own interests, aren't we? Constantly, I need to put more money in the bank. I need to work more hours. I need to put more presents under the tree. I need to catch those Black Friday deals. We're always constantly concerned with our own interests. But Paul tells us to have that same kind of focus and that same kind of passion for the interest of others. And let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. What is this one mind that we're supposed to have in us? It's the very mind of Christ. And what was the mind of Christ? Well, we get this, this very rhythmic liturgical statement or this poem or this song, if you will, this may be one of the oldest confessions of the Christian people, what they believed about Jesus in the entirety of the scriptures. This predates the Gospels. We get this statement that, that is the mind of Christ. And Paul tells us by the power of the Holy Spirit, who as though he was in the very form of God. Ladies and gentlemen, that invisible God that the scriptures talk about. Jesus embodies that living God. We see God face to face in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus is not just some good teacher or some rabbi or some uh, person who got it right and achieved great things or started a movement. Jesus is God in the flesh. Jesus is the one who John tells us in the beginning of his gospel in the first chapter in Archeo in Holagas. Kai holagas ein krastan theon. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were brought into being through Him. He's the one who says, before Abraham was, I am. He's the one who says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He's that pre-existent one, the second person of the Trinity, somehow unified in this great mystery that we call God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jesus was and always will be before anything was, and he, he is and is to come. He was in the very image of God. Now, when we hear that image of God language, it also brings us back to the beginning of the story, right? For Genesis 1 tells us that humanity, male and female, were created in the image of God. That we have that image, that we bear the very image of God. But unlike humanity, Jesus does not grasp equality with God as something to be exploited. He does not use his godness in exploitive ways. Now what do we see happen in the garden? Well, the exact opposite. God gives us this universal paradise. He says, it's all yours. You're stewards. You're the crowning gem of my good, good, and very good creation. Uh, just don't eat of this one fruit. Don't do this one thing. And what does humanity do? Well, a serpent comes into the picture and says, oh, you can eat of that fruit. You'll not surely die. God knows if you eat of that fruit, you'll become like God. And what does humanity do? Well, we reach for the fruit. We try to become like God. We try to be the gods of our own lives. And we're still trying to do that today. And it doesn't work out very well, does it? But Jesus doesn't come and exploit. He doesn't come uh, at the head of an army with a, uh, at the tip of a spear to bring some kind of empire. But Jesus 
empties himself. Jesus empties himself. Did y'all catch that? God empties himself. Well, well, what does he empty himself of? His, his power, his divineness? I mean, we see in the ministry of Jesus, he tells storms to shush and they obey him. He casts out demons. He walks on water. He turns water into wine. He cure, cures the, the sick and the lepers and causes the blind to see. He resurrects the dead. I mean, there's great power in Jesus, right? So what exactly is it that he empties himself of? Well, he empties himself of his royalty. He empties himself of the glory and the honor that are rightfully his. Like a king who comes down off their throne and lives like a pauper in an alleyway. Jesus empties himself of all his divine rights as the son of God. Oh, I came to tell you today that love came down. Love came all the way down. He empties himself. Or like our friend Charles Wesley says in that great Methodist hymn, And Can It Be? That he left his father's throne above. Emptied himself of all but grace. Emptied himself of all but love. He came to us. Tis mercy all, immense and free. That oh my God should die for me. And can it be that I should gain an interest in my Savior's blood? Amazing love. How can it be that thou, my God, would die for me? He empties himself and he takes on the form of a slave. Literally, the word there is a doulas, a slave. Jesus comes down all the way down and he's born into a manger, a feeding trough for animals. He doesn't come with uh, pomp and circumstance. He doesn't come uh, sitting on a throne or ruling over some kind of empire. He comes to demonstrate solidarity with the poor and the oppressed. He's born into a feeding trough for animals. Being found in human likeness. He comes all the way down into the human experience and knows the needs of hunger and brokenness and being weary and tired. And in His incarnation, He brings together and unifies the perfect nature of humanity and the perfect nature of God in this one person that we call Jesus of Nazareth, the fully human, fully God-man. Being found in human form, he humbles himself. He gets down on his hands and knees and he washes the feet of his disciples. And he became obedient. Obedient to a human life, obedient to a human body, obedient to the very word that he spoke into existence and lived out that law perfectly. And he became obedient even to the point of death. Oh, love came down. Love came all the way down. Jesus didn't bail out when the going got tough, but he died. For the wages of sin is death. And if you eat of this tree, you will surely die. And Jesus comes and takes that death. Our death. My death. Your death. But not just any death. Even death on the cross. The word there is staras in the Greek. The cross is the most horrible way that people were executed in the ancient world. The Romans despised it. It was reserved for the basis of criminals and insurrectionists. Uh, The Jewish people uh, despised it. They thought if anybody died on a cross, it was because they were cursed of God. And that's why many of them struggled to even accept Jesus as Savior. But Jesus dies for you and me. He bleeds on that cross for our sins. Exposed to the elements, He dies that shameful death. Love came down. (laughs) Love came all the way down for you and for me to take away the sins of the world. But love doesn't stay down. You can't keep a good man down. (laughs) That love comes down, but then that manger where the baby Jesus was, he's not in the manger anymore. It's empty. That cross where they hung him, that that cross is empty now. He's not there. The tomb where they placed his body, it's an empty tomb. Death couldn't hold him. He 
raised the grave, conquering master of all, who was resurrected from the dead, ascended, and therefore, because love came down, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so the name of Jesus. Every knee should bow and every tongue should confess on heaven and on earth and under the earth, and everything that is or ever will be will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. The glory of God the Father, He has descended into heaven. He sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence He will come to judge the quick and the dead. Love came down and love was raised up, and that love is coming again soon. This is not a Merry Christmas. Not for the broken and the afflicted, and whom those words Merry and Christmas seems empty and hollow. This is not a Merry Christmas if Christmas is about the Black Friday rush and the consumerist mentality of our culture. This is a Merry Christmas because Jesus came, put on flesh, and made His dwelling among us. You know, when I was sitting with my daughter, and literally with her being kept alive by a ventilator, over the last two weeks, just feeling so helpless, so powerless. And I'm a dad. We dads like to fix things. Can I get an amen from the dads? When something's wrong, we, we like to get in there and try to fix it. Couldn't fix this. Couldn't do anything but just sit silently by her side and hold her hand and tell her I love her. And do the most powerful thing that people do in those situations, pray. But sitting there helpless and powerless just by my daughter, um, being unable to undo the devastating consequences that she brought on herself, I could just wait. And I was holding her hand one night, just sitting there, and suddenly she, she came, she was kind of in and out of consciousness, and she came to, and you could tell she was kind of afraid and struggling, and she just looked over and looked in my eyes, and I was there holding her hand. And a little smile came on her face. And there was this peace and this kind of joy that came over her just because she saw Daddy Amen. and Daddy was there. Right. You know, sometimes we want God to come in and fix all our problems. We want God to heal us right away in one second. But the truth of Advent is that God has come. He's with us. Yes. He's Emmanuel. He's that patient and loving Father who sits beside us and holds our hand, even in the darkness, even in the afflictions of this world. God is with us, holding us in His arms, waiting for us to turn to Him. See, the truth of Christmas that brings merriment and joy in all circumstances is that love came down. Love came down and touched this earth with His great soul and transformed it forever. Yes. Love came down and fed the hungry and the oppressed and the broken. Love came down and turned the oppressive empires of consumerism upside down. Love came down and launched the grand plan of resurrection that even now all the universe is trembling and waiting for Jesus Christ to come. Love came down and touched my daughter and healed her in the hospital bed. Love a ragtag group of disciples and use them to transform the world and love has come down to you and to me. Amen. Thank you. That love has come down. But we can't hold on to it. That love that has lit our hearts on fire, we can't keep it in. It would burst us. That love that runs through our bones must be let out. And so love has come down. But we must go down. God put on flesh and made His dwelling among us. He made His love real in our life. But now we must go down and make God's love real for others. We must go down and become bread for the grumbling stomachs of the hungry. Amen. We must come down and become clothing for the shivering bodies of the naked. We must come down and become God's love in the place of need and fear and sickness and illness. And maybe we don't have the right answers and maybe we can't fix things. But just our presence 
can transform someone's darkness. Amen. We must go now and be the hands and feet of God's love in the world. What would it look like if we really lived out Philippians 2? Wow. If we really lived with the mind of Christ in us as a church, as a community, in that koinonia, that fellowship of love. You know, I experienced that koinonia from this church. I experienced that love. The world squeezed us and the gospel burst out. Amen. We have that love. But how do we go out and live that in our community? How do we truly look on the interest of others above our own interests? How do we live our lives in a subversive way to a market system that exploits where some have and some have not, some live in extravagance and some die of starvation? How do we be faithful and have that mind of Christ in us that was in Jesus himself? Love came down. And every time we come to this table, that is the center of our proclamation. We confess this ministry week after week. When we come to this table, we are face to face with the fact that, that love came down. Amen. That God put on flesh, made his dwelling among us. That God said, I love you this much. I will spare no expense. I will go to the depths of hell to have you with me. I will pay the ultimate price to demonstrate my love for you. So when we come to this table, it's, it's the Christmas table. It's the table where we come again and again to that truth that God put on flesh. That love came down all the way down, even to death, even to death on the cross. And so we proclaim at this table that Christ came. We proclaim at this table that Christ died. That he took away the sins of the world. We proclaim at this table that Christ was raised and that Christ will come again. Amen. For on that final night when Jesus gathered with his disciples around a common table, he took a common loaf of bread among them and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. This is my love made real in a tangible way. You can taste it and experience it right here, right now. Then he lifted up the cup among his disciples and said, This is the blood of the new covenant shed for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink, all of you, and do this always in remembrance of me. And so we gather here this morning in remembrance of Christ's mighty acts for us. And we proclaim that mystery together. That Christ has died, Christ has risen, and Christ will come again. That's the hope and that's the joy of Christmas. Not that we're going to have presents under a tree or hang some mistletoe or drink eggnog. <laughs> but that Christ has come. That Christ has risen. And that Christ is coming again soon. So I want to ask DJ to come forward and help with communion this morning. And if you are uh, here for the first time, we want you to know that the table of the United Methodist Church is an open table. Which means you don't have to be a particular persuasion or believing a certain theology or be part of a certain denomination. This is the Lord's table. It's open to all who would come and receive His grace. If you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, this is an opportunity to do exactly that. Uh, this bread and grape juice is shot through with the life of heaven. And we invite you to come and to spend some time at the altar. We'll serve this morning by intention, which is a fancy word. We're going to do it like those first Christians did. We're going to carefully and reverently take a piece of the bread carefully and reverently dip it in the cup, and then please feel free to come and stay at the altar. Come to the table of the Lord.